Deepa, could you please cue the presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, welcome to the Habitats Trust Grants first symposium of 2021. I would briefly take you through our grants overview and process during this slideshow. Next. The Habitats Trust was founded in 2018 by Roshni Nadir Malhotra, who is the chairperson of HCL Technologies, and Shikhar Malhotra, board member of HCL Corporation. The Habitats Trust were initiated to protect natural habitats of India and their indigenous species of flora and fauna through strategic partnerships focused on sustainable on-ground efforts, engaging technology for conservation and awareness generation. The Habitats Trust aim to provide support and recognition to passionate grassroots conservationists across the country. And lastly, the Habitats Trust aim to work towards innovative and sustainable and re replicable conservation initiatives on ground to secure habitats and species that are found in India. The mission of the Habitats Trust is to create and conserve sustainable ecosystems across India through strategic partnerships and collaborations with all stakeholders at, at every level. Next. We now come to the grants overview, where we will brief you about the Habitat Trust Grants program. Next. The Habitat Trust Grants aim to recognize and support organizations and individuals working in the field in India to conserve our natural habitats and indigenous species of flora and fauna. The grants also facilitate field activities and provide our partners an opportunity to leverage this support to make their work more sustainable. Earlier, the Habitats Trust grants were administered for one year. This year, we have increased the grant duration for two years to create a larger impact in the field of conservation. The grants are provided in these four categories. Strategic Partnership Grant, the grant amount given is 35 lakhs. Lesser Known Habitat Grant, the grant amount given for this category is 30 lakh. Next, we have the Lesser Known Species Grant. The grant amount for this category is 25 lakhs. And lastly, we come to our last grant category, which was introduced recently in 2019, the conservation grant, and the total fund allotted in the category is 15 lakh. I should also mention that towards the end of our grant application process, two finalists in each category are awarded 10% of the category grant value to support their conservation effort. Next. In 2018, the Habitat Trust received a total of 738 applications and 322 applications. In 2019, we received a number of 860 registrations and 297 applications. And last year, we received 4,311 registrations and 561 applications. As you can see, the number of registrations have exponentially increased each year, and the applications have been the highest in 2020. Next. We now come to our project partners working tirelessly in different parts of the country to conserve our natural habitats and species. As you can see the map here, we received a maximum number of applications from southern regions of the country. Hence, we have most of our partners working in different parts of Western Ghats. Our applications received were from the Western and Eastern parts of India. From 2018, our strategic partnership grant partners, Foundation of Ecological Security, have been working in Nagaland Best known habitat partner, ReefWatch Marine Conservation, have their projects based out of Andaman Islands, and our lesser known species partner, Sayadri Nisargitra, have been working in the Konkan region of Western Ghats. From 2019, our strategic partnership grant partners, Aranyak, have their project based out of the Manus National Park in Assam. Our lesser known habitat partners, Coastal Impact, work along the Goa coastline, and our lesser known species partner, the MetaString Foundation, work in different parts of the Western Ghats. Our Conservation Hero Grant partner from 2019, Ms. Neeti Mahesh, has a project set in the food district of Karnataka. From 2020, our strategic partnership grant partners, the Corbett Foundation, work in the Great Run of Kutch. Our lesser known habitat partners, Seed Trust, work in the Ayalur habitat in Tamil Nadu. Our lesser known species partner, Bat Conservation India Trust, work in the Kola district in Karnataka. And lastly, our Conservation ha uh, Hero Grant partner, work from last year, M. Surat, work in Garyabant, Baloda Bazar, and Mahasamun districts in Chhattisgarh. Next. In its first year in 2018, the Habitats Trust grants awarded a total of 60 lakhs to dedicated conservationists working to protect India's biodiversity. Our strategic grant partners in 2018 found 
Foundation for Ecological Security have been working to safeguard endangered and threatened species through strengthening the governance and management of community conserved areas in Nagaland. They aim to ensure protection of these endangered and threatened species in three selected landscapes in Nagaland. They're primarily working to conserve species such as Black Stragopan, Hulog Gibbon, the Chinese Pangolin, and the Great Indian Hornbill. Our lesser known habitats grant partners, Reforge Marine Conservation, have been working on protecting India's rainforests of the ocean, the coral reefs. Their project aims to regenerate coral reefs in Piriatapu, South Andaman Island. Our lesser known species grant partner, Sayadri Nisarg Mitra, are, lit are fighting for the world's most trafficked mammal, the Indian pangolin. The project aimed to conserve the Indian pangolin through community participation in the Konkan region of the Western Ghats in Maharashtra. Next. In 2019, the Habitat Trust grants awarded a total of 70 lakhs to dedicated conservationists working in, to protect India's biodiversity. Our strategic partnership grant partners from 2019, Aranyak, have been working on restoring the habitat of the last surviving wild population of pygmy hogs. The project aims at partnering to secure and recover Manus grasslands and threatened species. Our lesser known habitat grant partners from 2019 Coastal Impact have been rescuing and restoring coral reefs in Grand Island off the coast of Goa. Their project seeks coral transplantation needs for preservation of coral patches. Our lesser known species grant partners from 2019, the MetaString Foundation, have been assessing conservation status and needs of the Malabar tree toad through citizen based field surveys. And lastly, our conservation hero grant partner, Ms. Neeti Mahesh, has been tirelessly working to revive traditional knowledge to restore the riparian habitat along the Kaveri River in Kur district in Karnataka. Next. In its third edition, the grant, Habitat Trust grants awarded a total of 70 lakhs to dedicated conservationists working to protect India's biodiversity. For strategic partnership grant, we have the Corbett Foundation who are working on the conservation and recovery of the Great Indian Bustard. Our lesser known habitat 2020 grant partner, Seeds Trust, is working to conserve the Ayalur habitat and its biodiversity in Tamil Nadu. In the lesser known species category, we have Bat Conservation India Trust, who's focused on the research and conservation to prevent the extinction of the kola leaf nose bat. And lastly, for our 2020 conservation hero grant category, we have Mr. M. Suraj, who will be conducting anti snare walks in protected areas of Chhattisgarh to curb poaching. Uh, we have compiled short videos so you can take a look at their work. Next. Deepak, the sound. There's some audio. issue with the sound, please. Oh, let me just play this again. Six individuals rip. Can you please share your screen again? <laughs> With just 150 birds recorded worldwide, the great Indian bustard is on the brink of extinction. In India, the Kutch district of Gujarat is one of the last viable habitats, though only an all-female population of six individuals remain here. Their protected habitat in Kutch is limited to just two square kilometers, so these birds rely on the community grasslands of more than 40 villages in the area for their survival. The Corbett Foundation, which has been working to conserve the bustard in India, proposes to secure Great Indian Bustard habitats in Kutch by engaging the local communities residing within a 220 square kilometer radius of the core bustard habitat through awareness and capacity building programs for better grassland management.
The forests of Ayalur in Tamil Nadu are a lifeline for the communities that live alongside these forests and depend on them for their livelihoods. They're also home to an elusive and threatened primate, the grey slender loris. Anthropogenic usage beyond the natural regeneration capacity has degraded these forests, affecting both species diversity and tribal livelihoods. Seeds Trust has been working in Ayalur for over two decades with the vision of enabling local communities to become self-reliant and to conserve natural resources. Under the project, Seeds Trusts aim to reduce pressures on the Ayalur habitat by providing training to the communities on sustainable harvesting and cattle grazing methods. The rare and endemic Kola leaf nose bat is found today in only one cave of Kola district of Karnataka where their numbers have decreased to just 150 to 200 individuals. Change in land use, stone quarrying and rampant hunting for perceived medicinal purposes are driving these bats closer to extinction. Lack of information about the species is a major hurdle to conservation efforts. Bat Conservation India Trust has proposed an in-depth research to understand the behaviour and ecological needs of the kola leaf nose bat so that necessary steps can be taken to protect them. Snares used by both organised poaching syndicates and local hunters pose a grave threat to wildlife in the protected areas of Chhattisgarh, which is among the hotspots for hunting and wildlife trade in India. <coughs> for the past nine years, M. Suraj has been working alongside authorities in Chhattisgarh to curb poaching and sensitize the community on the need to protect biodiversity. Under the project, he proposes to conduct anti-snare walks in hunting zones and train frontline forest staff and local community champions on anti-snaring activities. I hope you enjoyed the videos of our 2020 grant partners. Uh, we will now talk about the eligibility criteria and guidelines for each category. Next. Strategic Partnership Grant. Our flagship grant is primarily for mid to large size field work oriented organizations in order to create a two way partnership to work towards conservation. The grant is for the running cost of all on ground projects. It is important that the organization applying for this grant has, a, has an annual expenditure of at least uh, 50 lakhs or more. The organization must also complete five years of functional existence by March 2021. We next come to lesser known habitats. This grant category is designed to look at overlooked or ignored habitats across India that need urgent con conservation attention and care. And through this lesser known habitats grants, we hope to bring to spotlight these vital habitats. The organization must have completed two years of functional existence before March 2021. Also, projects that engage the local communities in their efforts will be given preference. Next, we come to lesser known species. While a lot of attention is bestowed upon the charismatic species of the country, such as tigers, lions, leopards, rhinos, etc., this grant aims to bring species that are equally endangered and ecologically important and are lesser known into the spotlight. Hence, this grant aims to provide conservation support to various lesser known endangered species in India. The organization must have completed two years of functional existence by March 2021. It's important to note that projects that engage the local communities in their efforts will be given preference. And most importantly, uh, projects involving the captive management or breeding of species will not be considered, except in exceptional cases where on-ground conservation plans need to be supplemented. Further to this, you can visit www.thehabitatstrust.org slash grant guidelines to know the 42 lesser known indicator species your project can focus on and to read the rest of the eligibility criteria in each category. Lastly, we come to our last grant category, the Conservation Hero Grant, which aims to, the, to champion the work of grassroots individual conservationists working dedicatedly with little to no support to protect, India, to protect India's biodiversity. The grant provides them a platform to expand their activities and garner further support for their work in conservation. While the grant is open to all individuals, it is important to note that the individual should not be a full-time employee or board member of any registered not-for-profit entity in India. Next. 
We now come to the key evaluation criteria, basis on which each project application submitted by the applicant is evaluated upon. Next. The following are three criteria used in our evaluation process. The first is a problem statement. This cr criteria justifies a proposed project taking into account the on-ground reality and existing conservation efforts in the concerned target location. Then we come to relevance. Relevance of the project defines if the proposed project addresses key conservation issues in the context of the target landscape, that is flora and fauna, existing or upcoming threats to wildlife and habitats, involvement of stakeholders, etc. Then we come to methodology. Is there a, we ask questions like if there is a pragmatic methodology to achieve the proposed objective, is there a sufficient portion of the budget dedicated to carrying out project activities? Are the activities and methodologies well thought out and based on experience or research? Then we come to expected conservation impact. How strong is the expected on-ground impact of the proposed project and are there any measures or indicators in place to assess the impact of the project? Next, we come to monitoring, evaluation and documentation. How strong is the monitoring and evaluation with app documentation of the proposed project? Next, we come to stakeholder engagement. Does the project reach out to key stakeholders such as the forest department, enforcement agencies, local communities, farmers, students, etc.? And lastly, we come to sustainability and replicability. This criteria is based on if the applicant has proposed a long-term strategy, are there other funders on board to sustain the work? Does the proposal have a component of sustainability? Uh, does the applicant have strong fundraising skills? Does the project fall into the current conservation context, enabling the applicant to further the work? And can the project be replicated on a large or small scale while based at different locations? Next. We're almost at the end of the presentation where we will talk about the evaluation process of the Habitats Trust Grants. The recipients of the Habitats Trust Grants are selected through a structured, robust, and transparent process. The first round is the first level screening and shortlisting. We receive a bulk of application through our online portal. Successfully submitted applications and projects will be screened for eligibility, relevance of answers, and authenticity of information. A team of experts, including sector specialists and external auditors, evaluate the successful entries, after which 28 shortlisted applicants move to the field level verification. In the field level verification round, applicants are visited on locations by the Habitat Trust team. Applications are then screened further for the relevance and expected impact of projects. Based on the on-ground evaluation, qualitative and quantitative scores are assigned to each applicant. Based on the scores of each project, a presentation of each chosen project is prepared for our sub-jury, including the field level verification scores. The sub-jury panel shortlists three applicants in each category. Due diligence is further carried out of the finalists by our grants audit partners, after which the applicant presents their cases to the Habitats Trust Grant Jury, which comprises of four accomplished stalwarts who are passionate about wildlife and biodiversity conservation. That's all for Habitats Trust Grants overview. Over to you, Pooja. Thank you, Sunaina, for that, that crisp description. I would request participants to please drop in their queries in the chat box. We will get back to you on them in our next online symposium on March 11th. As you all may be aware, the Indian subcontinent is blessed with a very rich biodiversity. India boasts of harboring almost 8% of world's recorded biodiversity, despite claiming only approximately 2 to 3% of landmass. Of the four biodiversity hotspots in the country, the Western Ghats are one of the more popular ones, owing to its lush landscape and rich endemic assemblage. However, the Western Ghats are also faced with tremendous anthropogenic pressures and habitat loss. To talk more about the conservation efforts in the region, next up we have the fireside chat that you've all been waiting for. I would like to invite Dr. Guru Raja Kevi to moderate a dis discussion on exploring lesser known species from the Western Ghats. Dr. R Guru Raja Kevi is a faculty member and researcher at, the, at Shushti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology, Bangalore. His current research is in the fields of amphibian ecology, behavior and landscape ecology. He supports a citizen science program, Frog Watch India and is instrumental in an in-situ conservation program called Bhatracharyam. 
He has described three novel breeding behaviors in frogs, 21 new species of frogs from the Western Ghats and two new fish species. He is awarded with a State Biodiversity Award for Excellence Government of Karnataka in 2016 and a Geospatial Excellence Award for Frog Find Android app developed in 2014. Joining us in discussion are our speakers, Dr. Anita Varghese and Dr. Vivi Robin. Dr. Anita Varghese is director at Keystone Foundation, where she leads the biodiversity team at, uh, to undertake implementation and action research projects on human wildlife interactions, epiculture, restoration, field courses, climate change, etc. She is one of the founders of the Nilgiri Nature History Society and is chair of the newly constituted Western Ghats Plant Specialist Group of the SSC IUCN. Additionally, she is a member of the Plant Conservation Committee, Sustainable Use of Livelihoods Specialist Group Steering Committee, and SICAD Specialist Group. Dr. Vivi Robin is an assistant professor at ISER Tirupati and has been working on birds for the last 20 years, much of it on Shola Sky Islands. He has a PhD in ecology and evolution from NIAS IISC campus and a postdoc at Loyola University, Chicago. He has also been an NCBS fellow, a Salim Ali Lokwantho ornithological fellow and a Fulbright scholar and a national geographic explorer. We welcome all of you here today. Over to you, Dr. Guru Raj. Thank you, Pooja. Uh, welcome, Dr. Anita, Dr. Robin. So uh, we will start off like, uh, uh, I was just having a chat with uh, Dr. Anita earlier. Robin, we all, I think, uh, have the same starting point as bird watching. Uh, uh, I will uh, share the questions in a way that, uh, Dr. Anita will start and then Robin, you can take forward the same question and then we'll uh, move forward in the, uh, in the way that has been organized. Uh, Dr. Anita, can I have you on video, please, if you don't mind? Yeah. Am I not visible? I am... Yes, now, yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. So uh, we will begin with this uh, fantastic question of how we see Western Guards as an ecosystem and what is the relevance? And perhaps you can start from your uh, earlier research on bees and you move forward to the current work that you are doing. It would be wonderful to know how do you connect those things? And Dr. Anita, this is with you. Okay, thanks. And uh, Guru, how much time should, sorry if I call you Guru. <laughs> Dr. No, Guru, that's Raj, perfectly how... fine. That's no way, yeah. that's fine. That's right. So how much time should we um, totally have, please? Can, also in your interest. Do you have sense so of it that? is about yeah it's about 30 minutes that's given to us but last five minutes is for question and answer sessions okay. so we are starting at around six uh, like 428 now okay. we should be sure. able to do by 455 or so oh, right. 450 455 yeah yeah puja okay. will remind me about it. all right okay absolutely yeah. so. okay thank you so um Good evening, and it's wonderful. Thank you to um, both uh, THT and CSR Box for hosting this and for inviting us. I'm happy to be talking about our work. Um, so, you know, with regard to the Western Hearts, um, always feel very um, sort of proud and very um, sort, of, um, sort of, what should I say, um, you know, sort of um, yeah, blessed in a way to be living and to work in a space like this. It's an amazing space. It, it's, a, it's a landscape that for its diversity, for all that it uh, holds, you know, every day I think I am standing on the Western Ghats and that's a great feeling for me, you know, that it's really the foundation of where I am and where our work is based, our organization is based. It's a region of high uh, biodiversity, you know, in terms of plants, there's almost 7,000 flowering plants in this region of which about 2,000 of them are endemic. That means found um, either found in, only in, in the Indian subcontinent and also in the Western Ghats, but also found only in the Western Ghats. So in several ways, it has this very high biodiversity value. Um, as you Many of you probably know it's also a UNESCO recognized cultural heritage site because it also represents that equal amount of diversity in cultures and histories in um, you know different traditions that are here. 
And in our work in Keystone, uh, which we started uh, in from 1993, uh, the starting point was honeybees and what honeybees uh, mean to the ecosystem, how people interact with them, how is it, what is the larger role? And for us at Keystone, honeybees are as charismatic a species as any else. You talk about honeybees here and a lot of people's faces light up because you start to understand many things that they play in the ecosystem as pollinators, as um, migratory species, as you know, one of the things more recently is how they could be key indicators to what's happening to the climate. Like if the humidity is at a certain level, if the flowering has not happened, if the rain has not come at a certain time, these migratory species may not come to the mountains. And so they also act as very important indicators of the climate and environment. And very specially for Keystone, it's the relationship that indigenous people have with honeybees. The whole knowledge system that's uh, integrated in the way that they live and interact, yeah, with whether it's through honey collection or whether it's through other NTFP collections. So that's been the basis of our work. And having mm, lived and worked in this landscape for 30 years, you start to see so many more interactions. You start to see um, the role of a, a certain NTFP. You may have been, uh, you know, we start to see how much resin is harvested from the forest. But while you're studying that resin tree, you also understand that it has a very restricted geography. It's found only along riparian systems. It's only found in certain districts of our Western Ghats. And then you start to understand, like, you start to also question, where is the ecological knowledge? You know, how, do, how much do we know about a species? And when we're talking about interactions, uh, one of the things that you know, more recently, what is happening is here you are a township, human settlements growing, expanding in this Western Ghats. There's bound to be, I mean, there are benefits to it. You get clean water, you get fresh air, you get interactions with wildlife, which you didn't bargain for. And how do you negotiate those interactions? You're, you know, we're build, continuing to build roads. We're continuing to be, go ahead with our development agenda, but it's also a space that belonged to the Indian gore or the elephant or the tiger or several of the, for us, especially here in the mountains, the wetlands, the marshes, the lesser known ecosystems, you know, when those are converted, drained, uh, it becomes a school playground, for instance, how many species that are dependent on that kind of a niche or a specialized habitat, how many of those are lost? So these are the several kinds of issues that, or, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, issues that come up to you when you're living in a landscape uh, as diverse as this. And I just like to close by uh, just this particular thing. Mm, it's also the interactions. Uh, and more recently, like for instance, um, past couple of years, we've also had a lot of citizen, uh, citizens reporting on unique species or less, uh, less recorded species. And one such case was the Nilgiri Martin. Yes. Suddenly last year, there was a frenzy, you know, it was appearing in NDTV carried a story on it because there it was sitting on one of the rocks in our tea plantations. And this, what we thought was an elusive species is suddenly coming out into the open. People are photographing it with mobile phones. So there's a lot of uh, dynamism in this landscape which makes it ever more interesting to continue to work as an ecologist in this landscape. So I'd, I'd like to you know, hear from Robin going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful to hear. And, and to pitch my frog also in between here, I, I always feel that I should visit the Shola grasslands to figure out those uh, very unique frog species. Now, switching to Robin, uh, the bees and the birds and the relationship, Apart from that, like, how do you see the sky islands and the ecosystem that uh, we are talking about the Western Ghats? Your yeah. points will be, yeah. Yeah. Highly so, uh, yeah. yeah. Most of my work has been on these mountain tops uh, in the Western Ghats, that, you know, people are beginning to recognize as uh, sky islands uh, because they are isolated from each other, and there's, uh, you know, uh, millions of years of evolution that happened. Uh, you know, specialized organisms living on these mountain tops. 
So um, with the idea of um, lesser known species and um, uh, you know, that focus, keeping that in mind, uh, yeah. one of the things is, <clears throat> uh, like you pointed out, uh, Guraja, that most of us get into this game bird watching or you know, doing nature walks or things like that. And so you would think that birds are probably some of the best studied species. Um, but despite that, and, and you know, you probably hear about these uh, e-bird records, millions of records and millions of uh, observers and so on. Uh, but despite that, if you look at, you know, specific endemic species, um, you would find that there's not enough data uh, on many of them. So when I started uh, working on the short ring, which is the white bellied Sholakili now, um, so uh, I think there were so few records and uh, there were several ornithologists who told me that I'd probably never see them. But this was uh, simply a case of not knowing where they commonly occur. Um, and, uh, you know, just like uh, Anita was just pointing out that uh, um, uh, we, we underestimate how organisms adapt. Um, so a lot of these uh, birds were actually very close to human settlements in plantations and so on. Uh, it's just that we were not looking in the right places. Uh, so today, with even with millions of records of several birds, a lot of the Shola species are still very poorly recorded. Um, so I think that we have gone on to understand quite a lot about the distribution of these species. Uh, but we don't know uh, several critical aspects, like you know, uh, how far on the Western Ghats mountain, how far to the east do they go? You know, how much do they actually move? So we know that the Nigri pipit is probably found only on two big mountains. Uh, but uh, is there a seasonal movement? Do they go up and down? What is the elevation limit that they go up and down with? So I would I would think that there's still a lot of uh, you know a uh, lot of work to be done. Uh, in terms of um, uh, understanding species, even with the best known uh, taxa groups like birds. So I can only imagine, you know, uh, frogs and other, the, the real lesser known species, you know, how, how poorly we know them uh, today. Um, so I, I, I hope that, um, uh, you know, over the years that my team and others can contribute towards understanding and unraveling a little bit of uh, uh, you know, these birds' natural history uh, through some of these uh, scientific tools that we use, whether it is genetics or acoustics. Uh, what we're trying to understand is how these, how these organisms live and adapt. Uh, and what can we then, uh, you know, knowing this, how can we conserve them uh, in the future? Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic, fantastic, Robin. Yeah, it also brought me uh, to the Habitat Grants that 2019 they tried to, uh, like they gave it to uh, Metastring and uh, us working together on the uh, Malabar tree tour. So uh, it was one of those species like 1876 was the first report and then 100 years there was no report and till 2004 it was only four. And now people started seeing it everywhere with the citizen science initiatives. It is like 200 plus observations across Western Guards kind of thing. It, it is a fantastic, phenomenal thing, which just skip the attention. Like if you start observing more and more, perhaps we will have better understanding of these species. So that brought me to the second uh, question kind of thing that I have is, what are the kinds of threats and, and why do you think there's a need for conservation? Which is very trivial question to speak with you guys spending 20 years. And now if I ask why we, need conservation, but still for the uh, uh, betterment or better understanding for the audience, if you can pitch in for a couple of sentences, the, the need of conservation in this areas and what kind of threats we have. You can start Anita with, first uh, and yeah. then me, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, we, can, we don't always have to do that, Robin. We can also, <laughs> okay. So, sure. All right. So, but I'll go this time. So, uh, you know, definitely, I think uh, the lack of long term uh, studies, you know, so um, as also one of the recent, I think one of the papers that came out last year talked about how we've not had a single extinction in the past 70 years or something like that. You know, this was based on studies in Northeast and the way that protected areas are managed. Now, you know, we should have convincing evidence saying that 
uh, extinctions haven't happened. And that really depends on how strong our baselines are. Have we really uh, invested in finding out how much there is, you know, and just like lesser known species, there are those lesser known habitats. All of these, uh, you know, like the coastal plateaus or the Myristica swamps, um, you know, several, uh, the Shola grasslands, several of these highly threatened landscapes. What is it that we stand to lose there? What are the species, you know, those kind of basic uh, uh, level. And also bringing in an understanding of what are the kind of um, um, sort of impacts of human action on several species and landscapes. So I would say there's definitely a need for more longer term uh, investments in terms of studying and uh, bringing more students out into the field to do some of these estimations. So that's one thing I want to say, uh, you know, the lack of which is a threat to the diversity there. Uh, Robin, um, I'll go again after yeah, you yeah. if you want to. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think my personal experience, I have not directly like uh, done conservation myself, uh, but I feel like um, one of the challenges because conservation is where you add value uh, to something. So you say that this is important and hence we want to conserve. So that value addition part is a very human aspect. So I would think that like thinking a little bit, you know, philosophically, we really need to think about what we add value for. And uh, in the Shola system, I would say that my personal experience was that I came in from being a forest person. So I started watching forests, birds, you know, going to forests for bird watching. And um, obviously thought of forest conservation as being the real thing. And then maybe, I don't know, like 15 years down or something like that, I suddenly realized that this uh, Shola habitat actually has grasslands, which is not just something that you walk through, but it has some, you know, amazing diversity in it. Uh, and so, so uh, I think that just, um, you know, opening your mind about how um, how you value things. And um, I think that Guru Rajar agree with me because, uh, you know, that's exactly the problem with uh, other taxa and other habitats also are. Uh, it may be also with uh, certain ecosystem roles, for example, fire. Um, uh, again, I was very anti-fire because, you know, if you, if you love forests, you don't like fire and so on. But as you learn more, you realize that fire is actually a natural part of the, uh, of the system. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating that humans also have a natural role uh, in the system. And more recent work by Pro uh, Professor Sukumar's group has shown that you know, there have been uh, signatures of human presence and fire like uh, dating back several thousands of years. And uh, the role of people also, you know, there's a very nice study where uh, people asked the Todas about how they, how they perceive landscape change. And uh, they said, oh yeah, we think that so much percentage of landscape has changed. And we found that our uh, satellite imagery backed uh, maps uh, also found very similar kind of, uh, uh, you know, roughly similar uh, extents of uh, landscape change. So which means that uh, people who have very good knowledge of what's happening around them uh, they need to be kind of viewed uh, together with the with the ecosystem that that is being conserved. So I think that we probably need to think a little bit more about conservation and science uh, and how we value it, uh, so that we can sometimes be a little bit flexible. Uh, true, that. true, true. Like I, I think I heard uh, sometime back, uh, Professor uh, Vishweshara, who was part of the uh, the black hole theories proposed way back in 1970s. You're saying that science keeps us human and basic human qualities to be inquisitive kind of thing. So in, in perhaps many times we don't know about what actually conservation is, but being inquisitive and going there and searching for it, perhaps that itself is a starting point towards conservation. We don't know the big picture as of now yet. But in, in addition to this, uh, for both of you, if you see it not from conservation, but say, uh, ecosystem functioning or ecosystem functional values given to your species, uh, like your skyland birds, or for that matter, 
uh, Anita, the, uh, the knowledge system that you are looking at. So if you value it from that perspective, will this enhance uh, a, a way forward for conservation? What's your take on this? You know, see, the ecosystem services thinking is not new. And with the new, um, you know, the inter-government uh, panel on, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem services, more of this is getting globally and it's getting into policy. You know, people are thinking in terms of the value of ecosystems. Mm, I think that's definitely a very strong, um, uh, you know, USP of the Western Ghats, for instance. I mean, just the simple thing of water. I mean, Western yeah. Ghats means water, water that lifeline for all of us, right? So that value is already there. And I just want to share a short um, uh, incident from our own experience. So one acre of land was restored to a shola forest. It has about 20 species. It's, a, it's becoming a little shola patch, a fragment in one of our landscapes. That has helped recharge the water. Now, along with that, that also provides a habitat for leopards to rest or gore to rest. Now, you want the water, but you don't want the leopard right there next to your um, habitation, right? So these trade-offs and these uh, uh, models of how do you, um, coexistence is becoming a very cliched word now, but you know, ex actually live together have to also be discussed, yeah? So whereas there is a value, but that value also comes with a sort of cost and a price. And what is it that will help us um, accept everything yeah. yeah. So that's my yeah. thought on that. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Robin, you are. Yeah. I, actually, I, I don't really have too much more to add to that. But yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, this is something that um, we should value a lot more. Um, and it looks like it is happening. Uh, like in places <laughs> like uh, Delhi, uh, there are these biodiversity parks, which is just fantastic. The, the Yamuna Biodiversity Park and the Aravali. So if the governments are actually investing money in uh, restoring landscapes like this, uh, that's just fantastic. And I think that things like that, as it happens in more places, um, uh, the local communities would benefit a lot from, I mean, we are all local communities that they, in, a, in a larger view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. True. Very true, very true. So uh, taking a few more steps and uh, talking about your work, yeah, majority of the cases we are going as bottom up approach in our thought process in our networking and even in our conservation aspect so is there any quick examples from your work that this is what has happened may not be directly relevant to like we did conserve the species kind of thing but you started up in small way but it ended up in a bigger picture kind of thing in conservation or even for understanding a species anita you can take forward or Robin, you can take forward from examples that you have done as an example. Um, Robin. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's easy. because <laughs> now, This I is when we switch sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, that's a tough spot to be in because I haven't really done any conservation. Mm, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start with that saying that I probably don't have any impact on the ground in the way that uh, Anita and you folks have. Um, but um, uh, the, the research that we do, um, so I think that uh, like, you know, what, what I've been trying to do and what my group also tries to do is to try and piece together the puzzle of how things work. And uh, in the process of doing that, we did a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, we're trying to understand the birds. So to understand the birds, we try to understand the landscape. And uh, along came somebody with a very good GIS remote sensing skill set. And we started doing some extensive uh, mapping of the Shola habitats, uh, very detailed maps. And uh, slowly, you know, that work kind of has, uh, has become a little bit comprehensive now that uh, the forest departments are using it for uh, on the ground restoration. So we are able to kind of uh, inform the departments um, that, uh, you know, these are the areas where you have invasion, you know, light invasion where you can prioritize uh, you can say, okay, target these areas for restoration first, and then target this other area where you have 
more mature stands of uh, invasive trees and so on. So I think that that is probably the most that my uh, my work has contributed to uh, in the sense that we've been able to kind of provide information for action. I haven't been part of any action so far. Yeah. I think you're very modest. Uh, yeah, he's Robin. very modest. Just, and... He's very modest, <laughs> and I think it's a good quality. <laughs> so, but I think, uh, you know, this whole um, um, sort of focus that your group brought on to grasslands, you know, that would have impacted even the way we talked about restoration, because I think for forest departments and for several uh, programs, it was all about tree planting, perhaps, you know, and then this thing that it's not just about trees, it's about restoring a habitat, it's restoring a function of the habitat, restoring a service that the habitat provides. So along those lines, I think that's the kind, and I would also say that uh, in one of our pieces of work, this bringing um, more focus on what we call the hill wetlands. Now, as mm. per the Ramsar Convention, there is a definition of wetlands and none of the wetlands in the mountain areas qualify as wetlands under that definition because it's not inundated for, uh, with water for a certain number of uh, year, months in the year. And things. But that the fact that this whole wetland um, geology, which is linked to springs, to grasslands, which is what makes the Nilgiri such an important water, um, you know, uh, water conservation landscape. And that kind of an understanding, whether we work through schools, whether we work through the district administration, whether we work through uh, civil society, through diverse stakeholders, and that leading to some action and advocacy has really been something that we'd like to share from our side. Well. Wow. Perfect. So uh, Anita and Robin, it's actually uh, bringing up a new dimension in the sense that I, I studied complexity theories kind of thing where a small step will lead into a larger thing like you know the butterfly effects kind of stuff. Perhaps that's one of the way uh, forward also for us because we many times we not uh, evaluate those elements like you, you are very modest in saying that this was a team, we developed a team, even that itself is a part of large uh, thing because we are not still seeing the end as a big canvas. It is all started and it is all spreading and we are gaining knowledge in that sense. So mm -hmm. that itself is a great way to look at. And Anita, as you rightly pointed out, the more we start understanding like what is the function of these wetlands over there in the hillock, we perhaps have to redefine some of those definitions of wetlands and the string mm. uh, like strong boundary associated all, all those functional elements kind of thing i think we have to again relook at some of these uh, hardcore boundaries put inside the conservation efforts kind of thing mm -hmm. moving forward i think i will uh, perhaps have two more minutes too what i would do is like since there are many conservationists are in this uh, uh, discussion so uh, could you share some tips and insights from your journey uh, how it has been and it's like it could be like motivating it could be like some of those interesting parts so that many will have is how to start how to begin with and people have also asked me personally is conservation always linked with certification kind of so do i have to have master's degree in conservation to do conservation kind of thing or conservation can be passion driven so any insight from your side is highly appreciated yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I I like to say that you know I think one has to be um, ready for a long haul, because um, you're talking about small steps and uh, you know the ecosystem, what you're working with has so much um, uncertainty. There's so much that's not um, controlled that you one has to only uh, plan um, in small steps, but with a larger vision and also to be willing to. Um, you know, one needs a lot more openness because you you sit, you go to a landscape, you might go there thinking, I'm going to work on psychics or analysis, and it's my mission and goal to save the psychids of this region. And then you you have to sort of pick up what all is happening, which is also impacting your psychic, which is also impacting what's happening there. And you yourself, when, you know, it's not that you will be able to work on all of these issues, but how do you attract other people also then to come 
be part of this um, interesting landscape and how do you start to work together in interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary uh, and diverse approaches. I think that's something that uh, I would say, be open, listen to the landscape and uh, be ready for the long haul. So those, that's my- <laughs> oh, Wonderful, wonderful. Robin. Motivational speech. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Anita. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure uh, what to say here, but except that, you know, uh, all of us get to uh, some of these points as a product of different circumstances and opportunities. Um, and um, uh, I think that ultimately, uh, you know, the journey uh, that you have uh, through this landscape or through your work, I mean, in some ways, it's a journey within yourself as well. So unless uh, you are internally motivated uh, for doing what you're doing and you find satisfaction in doing whatever it is that you do, uh, I think it will be very difficult to go the long haul as Anita uh, you know, pointed out. So I would say that uh, you know, look for internal motivation and see um, if this is what you like doing, go all out. But uh, if you have doubts, <laughs> I think uh, there are a lot of other things to do where you may be internally motivated for. So, yeah. Wonderful point. Wonderful point, Robin. So uh, it requires, definitely it requires the internal motivation to stay. And as Anita said, for a long haul, like you, you have to have that, you, you can't expect uh, like within three years, you are going to do your PhD and then get publications done because we are looking at the system, which is natural. It is not that, we can do this in a lab scenario and construct and expand it and run the analysis, rerun the analysis kind of. So if one year there is no rain, that means you you lost or you have not visited, you lost that data. There's no way that you can generate that data. So we need to be prepared for these kind of challenges in the field. And again, as Sanita rightly pointed out, go with the like open mind to the field and perhaps something strikes there. It, it's not necessary a bird nor bee nor a frog perhaps it, it can be some grass also, who knows? So go with that open mind. And I thank you both for your valuable insights. Uh, I think Puja will now uh, look at the queries that has come. We will quickly pick up a couple of questions if it is there. Uh, I'm so sorry, sir. We are already shooting a little over time. Uh -huh. We can take queries okay. in the question uh, in the chat box, please. Thank you very much for that thought provoking and fascinating deliberation. It, it was really incredible. I would, I would now like to invite Sunaina for a walkthrough of the application process. And I'd request all the participants to kindly keep themselves on mute. And if there are any questions, please put them in the chat box. We have another virtual symposium on 11th March, wherein we'll address all of your questions. Our grant, grant auditors will also be joining us for the next session, and they will be able to resolve your queries regarding the governance, registration, and financial documents of your organization. Over to you, Sunaina. Thank you, Pooja. Um, Deepa, can you please cue the presentation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Habitats Trust Grants application process, where we, we will walk you through the application form and show you how to easily fill the form. Next. First, you need to register yourself on the application portal at www.thehabitatstrust.org slash grants by going to the homepage and clicking on the project and then the Habitat Trust Grants. You can also register by clicking on the Apply Now button that you will see on the screen. Next. When you click on the Habitat Trust, Habitat Trust Grants, you are brought to the Habitat Trust Grants page with all the information you need. Please go through it thoroughly so all your doubts are cleared before you start filling the application form. Next. Now to register, you need to provide your details here pertaining to the applicant and then you can create your account. You can also call the Habitats Trust Grants helpline listed at the bottom right of the website. Next. Once you create an account, you will be directed towards the first page of the form. Please note, all fields marked with an asterisk are mandatory. On the first page of the form, you're required to provide basic information pertaining to your organization and relevant contact information. Section one of the first page asks you if you're applying as an organization or as an individual. If you're applying as an organization, please select organization under applicant type. If you're an individual, please choose the individual option. Now you can select the grant category you wish to apply for. 
Individuals may apl only apply for the Conservation Hero Grant and for organizations, please input whether you are a private or a government affiliated institution. Next. For section two, you need to provide the contact information of the representative filling the application form who will be the primary point of contact for applications related communication. Next. Coming to section three of the first page, please check the box undertaking that the information provided in your application is true and correct to your knowledge. In section four, if you're applying as an organization, in this section, you're required to provide details listed here as described in your institutional documents. Total funding received and annual expenditure, including field activities, should be in line with your audited accounts for the previous financial year. Next. If you're filling the Conservation Hero Grant form, individual applicants can begin by providing their profile and official qualifications, as well as a synopsis of their previous work. At the bottom of the section of your Conservation Hero Grant form, please provide a minimum of one and a maximum of three recommendations. These may be from mentors, advisors, or partners that are informed about your work in the past. Moving forward, the remainder of the section is identical for both organizations and individuals. You would need to provide your years of experience in the field based on the actual duration that you have been working on ground, formally or informally. Next, please list the target species or habitats that you have covered under your existing or past projects. Next. You may also provide links for up to five important publications. At the bottom of the section, please list the key personnel of your organization along with their qualifications and a brief profile. You can provide additional information by clicking the green add more button on the side. Next. We now come to page two of the form. This section captures all the key details about your proposed project. First, start with the summary of your proposed project, focusing on the statement of need and listing out the expected outcomes. Next, please detail the context and problem statement for your proposed project. This would be a justification of your proposal considering the on-ground reality and existing conservation efforts in your target location. Next, please list the expected objectives of your project. The project description section should provide a complete overview of the proposed project. Here, please fill all the details pertaining to the project, including a description, descriptive problem statement, detailed list of activities towards achieving your expected objectives, and the outcomes or conservation impact that you expect to create through the proposed work. Next. Now we come to the expected conservation impact section where you must provide details of the measurable impact you expect to see on ground because of your project. Here, please list a minimum of four and a maximum of six key indicators that you will be using to monitor your progress. These should be quantifiable indicators that will be tracked regularly through, uh, through the two year project period. We believe that community participation is key to the long-term success of conservation. Um, here in this section, we would like to understand how your proposed project will engage the local stakeholders in and around your target area to achieve your project objectives. Next, please list the endangered flora and fauna that you wish to protect through your proposed project. Next. Now, please provide the exact location of your project, including its coordinates, which you may find on Google Earth, along with a map, which can be uploaded as a JPEG or a PNG image under 2MB. Then to provide a more detailed understanding of the important, importance of your project location, please describe the type of habitat and its ecological significance, the kind of terrain and key features. Next. The key to a successful project is a well-defined and pragmatic activity plan. In the activities and timeline section here, please list in bullet points the activities you propose to carry out in each quarter of the project period. It is important to describe your activities in detail. Next. As the grant is now for a duration of two years, you will have a total of eight quarters, four in year one, that is 2022, and another four in year two, that is 2023. Next. In the project duration section, please describe the complete duration of the project, including past activities and plans towards fully achieving all project objectives. This duration may, longer, may be longer than the grant period of two years. Under grant duration, please list the intended start date and the end date of the work that will be carried out under the grant. Projects must begin within the first six months of 2022. Next, please select whether this is a fresh project or a scale up of pre-existing efforts. Now you can tell us about any past work that has been carried out on the target species or in the project landscape, 
with scientific references or baseline data wherever possible. Next. If there are any institutions or organizations such as NGOs, government agencies, community institutions, or corporate partners associated with the project, please provide the name of such institutions along with the contact details of our representatives. Please list the key personnel who will be carrying out the proposed project down below. Next. In section six, please provide three references who are familiar with your work in the field, along with the name of their organization and the contact details of the person who's attesting your work. We may reach out to, the, uh, uh, to these references as part of our evaluation process. If your project requires permits, authorization, and licenses from any governing body, you can provide details on such permissions at the current and the current status. I must include, please always save and continue with the application or you may lose your data. Next. We're now on page three of the form and we've reached the budget. A descriptive budget is essential for a complete project evaluation. Please ensure that your budget is detailed and associated costs for all activities are covered here. If any of the budget heads are not applicable to your project, please check the box above. We start with personnel costs. Here, please include salaries, insurance, and provident fund in the costing. You should also tell us if the personnel are engaged part-time or full-time with the project. Next. We prefer projects with majority spending directed towards activity costs, so please be sure to list out all costs towards activities carried out under the project here. Next. Please list all equipment, including phones, cameras, laptops, etc., and other fixed assets that you wish to procure under the project, uh, proposed project in the equipment cost. Under travel costs, please list both local travel for the project team as well as travel of the head office team to the project site. This will also include any travel carried out for monitoring and reporting. Next. Now we come to communication costs, which will include monthly mobile expenses, courier, couriers, reporting costs, and any other costs incurred towards communication for monitoring and coordinating of the project. And lastly, we come to administrative costs, which cover your organizational overheads, like rent, electricity, bank charges, audit fees, et cetera, that would be incurred during the project period only. All the costs provided in the budget will be automatically calculated and summed to give a final cost for each budget head, as well as the grand total of your proposed project. Next. If your budget includes expenditure on fixed assets, please let us know how the project personnel and other stakeholders will be trained on use of the equipment and how this equipment will be used post the grant duration. We now come to the funding schedule. It is important to know that we do not release the grant in lump sum. It is dispatched in quarterly increments as per reports provided. In this table, please list the grant amount required in each of the eight project quarters. The grant total must match the grant total calculated in the budget table. The form won't allow you to move forward with your application unless these figures are the same. Next. Finally, please provide the total project budget, including funding from, the, from other sources. Here, please list the applicant's own contribution and funding received from the government. Under the others column, please list funds received from NGOs or corporates. The Habitat's Trust column will be autofilled based on the information provided in the budget table. Next. Finally, we've reached the final page of the form. In this section, applicants are required to provide all relevant documents that are needed to evaluate the governance and eligibility for the grant. All documents provided must be under the maximum size limit as stated against each field. Free online document compression tools can be used to ensure your uploads are not rejected. Please start by uploading a minimum of one and a maximum of four images of your target species or habitat. Next. Next, for organizations, please upload the relevant documents shown in this slide in either PDF or doc or JPEG or PNG format. Next, for individuals filling the conservation hero grant form, in this section in your form, please provide your profile, including an image of yourself. The profile should be under 500 words, as well as your PAN card and latest income tax returns. Along with this, you would also need to provide a minimum of one and a maximum of three recommendation letters. These can be the same as listed on page one, but must also be uh, on an official letterhead or signed by the person attesting your work. Next. Please provide any media coverage available of your past work. You can share links in the text box provided here or upload up to four images. 
This is applicable to both individuals and organizations. The final step of the application process is the declaration form. Declaration form for both organizations and individuals can be downloaded from the top bar of the application form page. These must be printed out, signed by hand, and then uploaded in PDF or JPEG format under 2MB. Next. In this section, please feel free to add any comments you have for the Habitats Trust team and any other information you would like to hi highlight or you think we should be aware of. And that's it. You have completed our your application form for the Habitats Trust Grants 2021. We hope the application walkthrough has been helpful in guiding you through the grants application process. If you have any queries, please email them to us and we will answer them in our next symposium on the 11th of March. We will be posting our email ID and phone numbers into the chat box here right now. You can also reach out to us on our helpline numbers listed on our website or at the Habitats Trust at hcl.com. Additionally, we'll be uploading an application walkthrough video next week on our website, which can help you whenever you need help filling the form. Thank you. Over to you, Pooja. Thank you, Sunaina. Participants, please feel free to share any queries in the chat box. And like Sunaina said, you can also send it to us over email. We will get back to you on them in our next symposium on March 11th. Now it gives me immense pleasure to invite Mr. Devesh Gadvi, Deputy Director at the Corbett Foundation, recipient of the Habitats Trust Strategic Partnerships Grant in 2020, to share his experiences about how the grant has been beneficial to them. Do Dr. Uh, Mr. Devesh Gadvi has been associated with wildlife conservation for the last 20 years. He is working with the Corbett Foundation since the last 10 years and is currently the Deputy Director. He has been working for conservation of the great Indian Bustard for the last 10 years and is also the member of IUCN SSC Bustard Specialist Group. And he has also represented TCF in the State Board of Wildlife, a statutory committee chaired by Honorable Chief Minister of Gujarat. We welcome you, Mr. Gadvi. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Okay. Um, very good evening to all. Uh, first and foremost, I was very happy to see Dr. Guru Raja, um, who taught me GIS in one of the workshops conducted in Gujarat. And it was really nice to uh, go through the uh, wonderful discussion that happened with uh, Dr. Guru Raja, uh, Mr. Vijayan, and uh, Dr. Aditha. There were very important uh, points which were discussed, and I could surely uh, associate with some of them. Now, regarding the uh, the project with, that we are planning to, uh, rather what we have started in Kach, um, is about conservation and recovery of the great Indian bustard, one of the most critically endangered bird species of India. Um, and you all know that there are hardly 100 birds on earth now with a very few males. Uh, so we applied to this uh, uh, last year's uh, application uh, of the Habitat Trust. And it was really wonderful to go through the amazing process that the Habitat Trust is following. There were, I think, there were four different presentation after which there was also a field visit where they interacted with all the villagers with uh, whom we are planning to develop a patch of grassland to community participation. The, the, the team visited the power lines that we have identified as one of the most risky lines where we are planning to put uh, bird diverters to reduce the collision rate. And they also interacted with the farmers. So I was going through the uh, discussion that was happening here and I would suggest all the uh, future applicants that be very frank in uh, discussing the project and very minute details uh, with the team, with the Habitat Trust, uh, because this helps in, in improving. Um, if there are any challenges or if there are any, any things which are doubtful to achieve, I would suggest that be very frank to discuss all this with them. Uh, so th these are the points from my side. Now, uh, shifting to the project that we are we have started in Kash, there are four different uh, activities that we are targeting. Number one is to develop a grassland uh, in collaboration with the villagers in Abrasa Tassil, where the busted population is there. Now, this is the place. Of course, the title is about conservation of the Great Indian Bustard, but this is the place where we have three different species of bustard. There is Great Indian Bustard, Lesser Florican, and the 
migratory uh, McQueen's mustard. So this particular development of grassland uh, is going to help all these three species. In this particular activity, we are going to work with the villagers and we are going to develop a grassland which will be managed scientifically by the villagers. We have done this already uh, in in last three years and we have achieved amazing uh, success in it where about 30 ton of grass has been harvested. So this is number one objective. Number two is to uh, promote organic farming. Why? Because this particular landscape is a home to more than 25 threatened bird species and majority of them are insectivorous. Now, we have been working here in, since last 10 years and we have observed that there is excessive use of pesticide, which is harmful not just to the insectivorous bird, but to all the other important uh, species surviving within this area. So we, we initiated this work uh, two years back and now we want to expand it where we'll be working with the farmers. Um, they will be growing uh, pesticide free products which will be linked to the market. Uh, so the farmers are getting more uh, economical benefit through it. And on the other hand, the, the, the entire belt that we are uh, proposing for this particular development is going to help not just the bustard but all the other species surviving within this area. Third and one of the most important uh, direct uh, mitigation measures that we have targeted is uh, to put bird diverters uh, on the selected risky power lines. Now there are three types of different power lines where we are going to install three types of bird diverters and we are going to study uh, its efficacy and how they are uh, going to reduce the bird collision. This is a very, uh, very, very important point as far as the busted uh, conservation is concerned because as per the study by Wildlife Institute and many other uh, ornithologists across the world, uh, busters are prone to collision and unless and until we, uh, we solve this issue of collision or we try to reduce the possibility of uh, collision, it will be very difficult to save the species by just managing the habitat. Uh, we do have a successful program by Wildlife Institute and Rajasthan Forest Department through which they have a conservation breeding center. But until and unless we have uh, some proper plan to mitigate the power line designs and to save the species from the collision, it will be tough. Therefore, uh, we had also incorporated this particular objective where we, are, where we are going to put bird diverters on the risky power lines. And the fourth objective of this particular project uh, is to conduct nearly 30 large awareness programs uh, within the school villages. There will be multiple field visits for the students so that they can understand the issue. There will be some program with the uh, village uh, sarpanch and some of the stakeholders. Uh, we will take them to the field and we'll show them the issue so that they can understand and they will be involved in the conservation program. So these are the different uh, objectives on which we are going to work for the next uh, one year in collaboration with the Habitat Trust. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful address, Mr. Garvi. I'd now like to welcome Mr. M. Suraj, recipient of the Habitats Trust Conservation Hero Grant in 2020 to share a few insights of his journey with the Trust. A former MTEC student who chose to pursue conservation instead, Mr. Suraj is involved with multiple tigers estimation programs, scientific studies, conservation actions across very difficult and least known habitats of Chhattisgarh that suffered political unrest. Thank you. Thank you, Puja. Thank you very much for inviting me on this platform. So, uh, hello to everyone. This is Suraj from Ch Chhattisgarh. Chhattisgarh was bifurcated from Madhya Pradesh in 2000. Uh, and that time, uh, a state full of jungles and uh, uh, full of wildlife was bifurcated from Madhya Pradesh. Then uh, uh, what we see, uh, although uh, my, our state is very beautiful, it's full of wildlife, waterfalls, nature, but simultaneously here, uh, beneath the ground, it is also rich in um, resources, mineral resources. We have iron, we have gold, we have diamond. 
so uh, at some part uh, they, we need to made a choice we need to made a choice between either economy or environment so here comes a big problem a person goes to democracy and says i want to mine the diamonds i want to fill the stomachs and another person goes to the democracy and says there are few tigers i have to save the tigers uh what do we expect democracy to listen to definitely uh, he will go for mining because uh, mining brings lot of money it uh, fills lots of stomachs so here uh, another uh, difficult part for uh, conservation is uh, there is a severe political unrest uh and where the political unrest is there at that very place law enforcement is very difficult to implement and where the law enforcement is difficult to implement then at that very place wrong doers uh, like poachers and uh, hunters uh, goes on rampant in their activities so uh, Uh, as uh, puja described that i am basically from engineering background and uh, you know from non wildlife background uh, being from non wildlife background it's really difficult to think or uh, took approach for conservation there are number of challenges you face where uh, people simply strike out you saying uh, this non wildlife people what do he know or what do he do uh my journey of uh, writing proposals to donor agency started 3 uh, years back uh, after number of i don't know how many but uh, number of times i have rejected even uh, i had applied to habitat trust for uh, their previous cycle of grants and uh, i have rejected due to some reason but uh, whenever i uh, get rejected at that time my pen become stronger and stronger next time when i write my words would go with more precision precision with more confident and that confident builded me uh, built in me since last 3 years made me write even more good proposal this time and uh, again i have chalo ek baar try dete hain again i have written a proposal uh, this time my proposal was more on conservation action i used to be involved in conservation actions like rescue release work uh, awareness part uh, interacting with uh, locals during human elephant conflict mitigation so i had uh, i had to um, make my choice between three proposals either a species specific conservation plan or human elephant conflict mitigation plan or anti poaching uh, like conservation plan so i had gone for uh, anti snare walk after a number of days of brainstorming and uh, applied it to habitat trust at that time uh in past 3 years i had uh, involved in number of projects where uh, i have done good field work so that i have a good uh, number of statistics gained that help me to uh, explain or describe my problem or my point of proposal so uh, keeping all these things in mind and uh, uh, i have written the proposal in a manner make it checked by two to three experts consider their reviews over it and then i finalized the proposal and send it to the habitat trust uh first when i applied uh, i called to my mentor dada mujhe tension ho raha hai uh, whether i got selected or not then uh, first phase cleared i got selected then again dada mujhe tension ho raha hai second and second round mein uh, jaunga ki nahi uh, then my mentor say uh, need not worry number of people uh, not even crack the first round tension mat lo tum aage jaoge uh, similarly first round second round third round and uh, to, uh, to my luck uh, i got an opportunity to uh, 
uh, face in front of the renowned uh, wildlife uh, expert, Dr. Ranjit Singh, sir. And uh, after that, <laughs> so happy I got this opportunity from THT, my first win in last eight years of wildlife conservation. And uh, I'm right now uh, we are starting the project and hope uh, soon will come out with very good results that help in conservation of wildlife in the state. So with these words, I will arrest my uh, talk. Pooja, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Suraj. With this, we come to a close for today's symposium. Before wrapping up for the day, I would like to acknowledge and appreciate our esteemed speakers who took the time out of their busy schedules and showered us with their knowledge. We are truly humbled by your presence. Thank you once again. I would also like to extend my thanks to all of you for being such a wonderful audience. Please note that we have another symposium lined up for 11th March, that is next Thursday, and we will be answering most of your queries that time. In case you still have any queries, you can put them in the chat box here. We'll compile and answer all of them in the next symposium. We will also be joined by Mr. Saurav Madhotra, co-founder and designer of Rural Futures at Balipara Foundation in the next symposium on 11th to conduct a masterclass on economic valuation of nature and community forest management in the Northeast. So stay tuned. Hope you have a great day ahead. <laughs>